Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. Michael, over to you. Thanks, Alyssa. Welcome uh, to today's webinar on mastering the early stages of government contracting. Um, we have an hour today with an amazing set of panelists. We have one panelist still working on some audio issues at DOD, which is always an adventure getting into a non-secure um, webinar link on, on Zoom. So we'll give Teresa a couple minutes, um, but let me give a quick rundown so far for participants on the call. As we're going through, please feel free to add your questions to the chat and we'll try to get through them as the panelists go through your answers or we'll add uh, responses at the end. Um, our whole point is trying to deliver best practices for, for those of you from the practitioner community on both uh, public sector procurement, so both the, the buy side and the sell side, so folks at federal agencies involved in procurement policy and obviously federal contractors is the, the name of the game. Um, my name is Michael Crosby. I'm CEO of Leadership Connect. I'm your moderator for, day, for today. Really excited to host this panel. Um, from our, we have about 1,200 clients, 40,000 users. So this is a topic, mastering early stages of government contracting that comes up, uh, especially in the emerging tech community uh, on both sides, both with contractors and um, procurement offices and programs. So really exciting to moderate today. Um, I'll start with super quick introduction of our panelists, uh, and then I'll, I'll leave it to each of you to do a quick introduction, and then we'll we'll jump into the questions. Um, it's an amazing panel. I had one-on-ones with each panelist uh, in prep for the webinar. We probably have two days of material, but we're going to pack it into to one hour. Uh, we have Teresa Terry with us, category manager with the Air Force. Um, Live, <laughs> live in a uh, secure setting. Uh, Duke DeLuca with the Institute of Defense Analysis and consultant on uh, defense and large engineering projects, formerly with the Army Corps of Engineers. And Noura Bashur, entrepreneur and acquisition expert with Voltron. Um, so let's do a quick panelist you know, bio, maybe 30 seconds each person. Uh, Noura, uh, uh, Nora, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, Teresa, I'll finish up with you. Make sure your audio is working. Uh, Nora, you know, quick introduction. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, great to meet everybody. I'm Nora Bashur. I lead growth at Voltron. Uh, before joining Voltron early this year, I spent several years on the federal contractor side. Prior to that, my area of expertise was in healthcare, specifically in technology adoption and the design and development of uh, telemedicine clinical care programs. On the federal contractor side, I actually started in contract compliance and administration, and then I made my way across the board to uh, program management and eventually business development, which I which I just adored. Um, along the way, I've written more than my fair share of proposals, and I developed kind of a very strange affinity for the crazy and complex world we all know and love of federal contracting. I'm really excited to be here, and I can't wait to hear what Teresa and Duke have to share with us today. Thanks, Nora. Uh... Duke, uh, you're next. Uh, thank you, Michael, for inviting me to participate today. Uh, I have 32 years in the Army, an engineer officer and a Eurasian foreign area officer. I commanded two Army Corps of Engineers divisions. I was also a customer of the Corps of Engineers and other service and DOD construction agencies uh, while I was still in the service. Uh, since retiring from the Army, I'm a private, uh, I'm an adjunct research staff member at IDA, as Michael mentioned, but I'm also a consultant in private practice in the commercial and federal markets with a variety of AI, IT, and uh, architectural engineering construction clients. Awesome, dude, thank you so much. And Teresa? Teresa, we're not hearing you. We can see you though. We were hearing you before. No. Nope, not yet. We were hearing you before. So um, Michael Crosby with 
with Leadership uh, Connect. Uh, my background, working with data and technology businesses for the last uh, you know, 20 years. Uh, we work with uh, about 1,200 organizations, federal agencies, Office of the President, the Hill, and a lot of contractors in, in policy shops. So we love to bring people together to share best practices because we hear both sides of the aisle and both sides of the equation in terms of both buyers and sellers and what they're looking for. Um, so it's always good to like connect the dots to make sure that you know contractors are doing a great job of engaging with um, federal agencies and vice versa. What do federal agencies expect to see and, and hear from the contractor community? Uh, so I will jump into the you know, first question. And uh, we had our happy hour last night. We actually heard this very question from uh, a tech contractor that works with a uh, larger, they're very small, but they work with a larger defense contractor as, as a sub and they want to go direct. And this is the first question. So where should tech companies uh, start? Um, all of you have had some experience working with you know, emerging tech, AI. Um, if you go look at DOD's website or the White House's you know, website around technology procurement and working with small business, there's something coming out every you know, few months around the need to broaden the industrial base and simplify procurement. Um, so when you think of like a tech oriented emerging um, company and what, what channels they should focus on to maximize their success, time to market, likelihood, you know, what are your words of wisdom? Maybe let's start with, with Duke. Sure, Michael, thanks. Uh, so there's some basic questions you have to answer up front, depending, and the answers vary depending on the size of your firm. Obviously the technology readiness level of the tech that you're trying to sell, that's very important. I, we don't need to go into detail about that right now. We can later if we want to. So you mentioned uh, some are tier one, they wanna be prime vendors to the government. Some are tier two markets, which they wanna sell to the original equipment manufacturers or to other prime vendors of the government. That's a whole different set of decisions and strategies associated with those two tiers. And then in, in each of them, there are what I call swim lanes. That's not an official term, but there are some uh, solicitations and uh, procurement methods that are rapid, more, let's say more rapid for the government, not, not rapid. Um, but they have, uh, they're more competitive. There's lower probability of win. The values tend to be lower. Uh, but as a small company trying to get purchase and also perhaps fundraise, the fact that you can show you have some federal contracts, however small, shows that the government is investing in your tech and more is likely to follow, right? Success breeds success. And uh, the intermediate swim lane is, uh, you know, those are some rdt &E funds, some commercial solutions opportunities, some things that are called sibbers and sitters, which we can talk about if you like. Broad agency announcements, be careful with those because they don't always have money against them. Uh, commercial solutions opportunities do always have money. Competitions usually have money. And then in the case of the services and DOD, sometimes there are operational need statements or joint urgent operational need statements. And those are for tech that's really at TRL levels seven through nine. It's you know commercial solutions that are being used in the field, if not for military missions, but they could be, you know, dual use. Um, that's the fast swim lane. Intermediates, generally it's another transaction authority that's used. There's all sorts of ways of man managing those. We can talk about those later. And then the slow to very slow method of procurement is the federal acquisition method and the three tier sort of what's the requirement. We're going to program the money in an annual federal budget, and then we're going to go through an acquisition process. And that is high, high frequency and high quantities, lower P probability to win, but lots of potential for large revenues and continuing revenues. But that's very slow. And so those strategies vary based on the condition of your firm, your working capital, your fund you raise, your tax, you know, your runway, whatever, whatever size firm you are, you're going to target different parts of those tiers and swim lanes. Great response, Duke. Appreciate it. Uh, Nora, Nora, same question. Yeah, and I think, um, I think I, I absolutely agree with everything that Duke said. Um, and I'm also going to kind of maybe take a little bit of a sidestep in terms of federal contracting isn't easy. And so sometimes you hear this advice of like, get on contracting vehicles, get on schedules. But if you think about it from the, the perspective of subcontracting, it's a little bit of a lower barrier to entry. And it allows you to build credibility and gain experience 
as well as develop some critical relationships. Um, there is pressure in subcontracting, but the pressure on the prime is, is much greater. So give yourself some time, look at what's behind the scenes and learn how to do things um, like determine pricing, allocate costs. Uh, in federal, you have to be careful because in some cases there's no do-overs. Um, one thing that I've learned kind of looking back when I started my federal journey on compliance, it gave me a great appreciation for why the government purchases the way it does. They experience risk when they're purchasing and sometimes because their budgets are so large, it's easy to forget that. Um, I would say on the program and strategy side, kind of really, really high level, start developing a deep and long-term understanding of why programs exist, why solicitations exist. There's a purpose of why things exist and they're tied to strategies and larger initiatives. And those strategies and larger initiatives are tied to even larger initiatives. So sometimes it takes a few years to really get a, a deep understanding of that. Excellent, thank you, Nora. Teresa? I did miss a question, my apologies. Can you oh, hear me? No, no problem, so the- Okay. Uh, and appreciate you sticking with, with us through some uh, AV challenges. So the question was, where should uh, where should tech companies start, like in terms of channels they should consider, you know, methodologies for uh, you know building uh, building a business, kind of presenting their capabilities, you know, sure. let's say just from a you know DoD perspective. I think you know, Duke and Nora gave gave a perspective, which I think is um, you don't always hear of like. Perhaps looking at the subcontractor channel might be the fastest time to market, or certainly something you'd want to strongly consider, um, you know, first. And maybe that's not, you know, the most common advice at least you'd hear a couple of years ago. So, Teresa, what, what are your thoughts on on this topic? So I was so. Glad to hear Nora say that because that's kind of been my thing I've been telling folks lately about trying to get into government contracting. Before I get too deep, um, you know, these are my opinions and I'm not speaking on behalf of the Air Force or the DOD at large, but just Absolutely. from my experience. <laughs> um, so one thing I'm going to tell you is uh, it is imperative that you know my mission and know how your capability fits into my mission. If you can't speak to me for what you're working on and how I can tie it in and make my life better, make an airman's life better or a guardian's life better, um, it is really difficult for us to follow anything that you're trying to do. So if you're really focusing on the federal government and you have a specific office that you want to get at, that could be an easier way to narrow your focus on because the federal government's huge, um, the Department of Defense is huge, and so on. Even the Air Force itself, we were just, I just came out of a meeting. We have over 700,000 people. We have all these functional communities. So narrowing it down to something that you're really good at and understanding a mission is great. My other piece of advice would be I would also exploit that subcontracting piece. Go there, get all the feedback you can, take the lessons learned, see what not to do as well as learn what to do. That is an awesome place also to get your facility clearance, which can also be a barrier to entry when it comes to doing federal contracting. Facility clearance is really difficult to get. A lot of times we'll do RFPs, request for proposal, and we'll say the company already has to have a facility clearance to even propose. Well, as a subcontractor, you can, uh, if the prime has it and there's work that has to be done, they can sponsor you to get that facility clearance. That's another uh, tip that I have there. But I'll stop for now because I will get on my soapbox and I don't want to do that over. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, great answer, great insight, you know, Teresa. And you had a great line and, and maybe we go to, you know, Nora next of, of not spoiling your moment. So when I think of, you know, often we hear about best practices, what should you be doing, but it's almost just as, or more important to know what not to do. So like some of the contractors, you know, we've spoken with, um, the leaders in those organizations would have a concern that, you know, some of their team members won't necessarily prep for a meeting, you know, I'm sure. Teresa, that's never happened to you. Um, Ever. But like, Ever. <laughs> when you think of what not to do, like what are the, you know, your line of don't spoil the moment, you know, which is probably, you know, extends beyond contracting to, you know, all aspects of someone's life. But maybe Nora, we'll start with you. Like, how do you not spoil your moment? You work so hard to, you know, get in front of someone, 
uh, you know, start to present your capabilities? How do you not spoil your moment when, when you are lined up to help someone? That's a great question. I want to play off what Teresa said. Um, we're seeing, as contractors, we're seeing this significant shift at the agency level from, it used to be, come to the table, you know, ask me about my problems or challenges or goal. And now what we're hearing is, come to the table and you need to have a deep understanding of my mission, my strategic priorities, my challenges and goals, and speak to that. And I want the audience to think a step beyond coming to the table with tailored solutions because that's self-focused. So come to the table as a thought leader and catalyst for advancing the agency's mission, their broader goals of the industries that you both serve. And that's one of the ways you can make the most out of kind of every one of those moments you get. And then remember on the operational side, in the commercial world, you can go after money and then operationalize to execute it, but it's the opposite in federal. So I'll leave it there and I'd and, uh, love to hear the other panelists speak to that. Thanks, Nora. Uh, Teresa, this is your line. Love to hear your response to it. <laughs> nope, uh, spot on again. I know that, um, and I'm not sure of the business sizes of everybody on the line, but for small businesses, it's usually tougher to get that spot in front of a senior leader specifically, because I work at the headquarters, right? So I can give you real time for what I see on a daily. When you finally do get that moment, and matter of fact, I just left a meeting. This is why I was uh, coming back from that, and I was able to get a small business in front of a, one of the senior leaders. And they were so prepared because they actually listened to what I said. They looked up that mission. They looked up some of our pain points because the federal government is becoming more and more transparent with what's happening. We post a lot of things on our social media now. We post a lot of things on our outward-facing websites. So they came in knowing that there was a delta somewhere. And they were able to talk to how their their capability could fix that issue. The senior leader never had to spend time saying what their mission was. And I got to watch real time how the light bulb went off, they got excited, and now there's a follow-up conversation. So those are the things about not spoiling your moment. The other piece is this, and, and I, 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 please do not lead a conversation with your Rolodex or your socioeconomic status. You've already lost the attention of the people in the room because most of the time the folks that you're talking to have no idea what you're talking about or it can be perceived as, okay, you knew general such and such or Mr. Such and such or honorable this, but what does that have to do with you meeting my mission? So those are my two free nuggets for you. Thanks so much, Teresa. That's great advice. I definitely have heard uh, multiple contractors use that exact strategy and we're your audio is going to in and out a little bit teresa sometimes you're perfectly clear sometimes a little garbled uh, duke uh, same question so uh, i would say uh, the summary is don't fight the requirement so the formal proposal will have contract requirements by the time they've issued a formal proposal it's past time for you to have shaped that requirement you're going to comply um pre-solicitation you have lots of opportunities to shape the statement of work and the requirements and that's an engagement strategy that we can talk about later. But then there's compliance things. And with the government, federal government, and especially DOD, there are a lot of compliance requirements that exceed what you do with commercial industry or other places, state governments, et cetera. And until you comply, your suggestions about how the standard is stupid are not going to be received. You know, Until you comply, you have no credibility that this is a bad way to do cybersecurity. We have a better way. Maybe you do, but no one will listen to you. I, I had a major client, a huge firm that everybody knows, they wasted 18 months trying to tell DOD that their standard was dumb. Finally, they just complied and now they have traction. Now they can affect change within the organization and how they do their standards. But um, don't fight the requirement, uh, comply. And then you can influence, right? That, that's a great segue into, um our next topic around, you know, middle market kind of larger businesses within the technology space that are successful, but relatively neophytes to, um, you know, federal contracting. And so often we'll, we'll hear from, you know, people running those businesses that uh, they're looking for justification and guidance around how do they present to their own internal teams about the opportunity within the federal market and you know you know, we'll often see within within that type of business 
that most tech companies don't, you know, they don't get out of bed thinking about selling to the federal you know, government. There's a, you know, Palantirs and Andrews of the world that have built, you know, a business around, you know, defense tech or, uh, you know, federal state and local model. But most company, most tech companies don't think of that as their first and foremost opportunity. So what is your, you know, you talked a little bit about Duke with your, you know, cyber, cybersecurity example of, uh, you know, having someone, you know, preach to the DOD and then eventually having to change, change their tune. Um, but, you know, what is your guidance for kind of convincing someone that this is an important market, you know, for them, uh, even though it might not be the primary focus? Duke, maybe we'll, we'll start with you on this one. Sure. So uh, there's no, make no mistake, it's a strategic business decision to be in federal markets. It's not a revenue smoothing tool for next quarter when you think you're going to have a slow quarter. It, that can't be it. You really have to be committed and it is, it takes longer. It's more expensive to engage, to business develop, to capture, to propose and to win contracts than it is in the commercial market. It just is. It takes longer. It's very relationship driven. So you're going to be cultivating uh, long-term relationships with organizations and individuals. Uh, sometimes some of those individuals do move a lot, especially the military uniform people, but others don't, civilians sometimes don't. So you are making a very, very large upfront investment. Now the payoff is if you have are, are part of a key solution for a federal market, any agency, pick one, uh, that is a, generally a lot of money and it's a long-term process. It's a life cycle that they want to evolve with you. They want to evolve the capability with you. They don't want it to end in a year to five years. They want it to continue to evolve and they'll pay for that evolution. So it, it offers some very large continuous, in the construction world, it's called backlog, you know, revenue streams that you can count on for a number of years, which is great for planning businesses. Um, and I think, uh, I think I'll just leave it there for now and let the other panelists answer because I'm sure they have some good insights. Great, thanks, Duke. Uh, Nora? I love what Duke said. I just think it's that that long term vision, and it doesn't matter what size you are. And be an industry architect, not just a problem solver. So agencies, if we think about it, they're mission driven. They're not profit driven. And contractors who understand that get that it's not about selling the agency something. It's about showing how your expertise can help that agency achieve their mission in a meaningful way because that's their reason for being. So our roles become. Uh, be an industry architect, be a problem, um, be an expert advisor, and be forward thinking. And we've got to serve this up for free because there's a greater purpose here that we're all working towards. So if you've got data research, insight into trends, bring those to the discussion, bring your insights. And beyond solutioning for today, we're going to start solutioning for tomorrow because we have to help prepare our government and these agencies for tomorrow because we're all in this together. We need to help them anticipate future shifts in technology, policy, public needs. And there's always long-term initiatives that you can be a part of to drive this positive change. So you've got to really kind of get in there side by side, show how your company can contribute to the thought leadership, and then work on these initiatives that benefit both the agency and the broader market. Can I answer, Nora? Uh, Teresa, same question. All right. Can you hear me good? Yes, perfect. All right, perfect. So I'm going to go the opposite of them just right quick. I think these long-term relationships are great, um, but please don't ever rest on that too heavy because there's always another contractor who has a greater idea or a greater approach or is a little hungrier. And then we will, because competition and contract says that we should, we shall go to another vendor that can move us forward. Um, I have witnessed personally long-term relationships. We've had the same vendor in the space for 15 to 20 years, and we didn't change a thing. We finally changed our contractors and realized that we missed out on a bunch of capability because folks got comfortable. So please, as you are in these spaces and you are building these relationships, always be looking forward to the next thing. Don't rest on your laurels at all. I call it incumbinitis, right? You're shocked, too, when you compete and you don't win it, right? It's because sometimes we get comfortable and we're like, well, I know what they want. You know, I've been in this space for 10 years. My favorite line in RFPs, I know your mission. I've been here for 10 years. And then when you lose, you're upset, right? Be careful of that. Give us something new. Stay innovative. Technology is running laps around the government all the time. 
if our contractor is not running the same laps with technology, uh, we tend to lose focus on them and look for someone else that can take us forward. So I think it's smart. You want to build those long-term relationships. You always want to give that, that factor, that differentiator that says, I need to keep them there. What is it? Um, and then remember that and let that be your, your focus and not just focus on, okay, I'm in, I'm going to stay. Over. Absolutely. Yeah, that long-term relationship is a business intelligence function. So you aren't surprised by this evolving requirement that's coming out of Air Force, Army, DHS, whomever, VA, whatever it is. That's the key. You understand the terrain. And by the way, the competition, whether they're new entrants or not, because you're in that communication network uh, through those relationships. One last thing I'd like to offer the tech community that's listening in. It took a number of painful and long decades to, for the government to transition from buying software to software as a service. Um, and it's going to take, it'd be just as painful a, a transition. We're starting to see it now. It will not be as long, but it will be painful where the agencies will be buying capability as a service. That's a broad term, but there's all sorts of things, especially with autonomy and some other things that can be applied onto systems where the government maybe shouldn't own it and won't be able to evolve it as quickly as private industry. And they're not quite ready. The government markets aren't quite ready for that capability as a service yet. So if you're pitching that, be ready. It may be a couple of years before the, the market's ready to hear it. It is coming. And if you're ready to deliver it when, when, when it comes, then you'll be uh, ready, prime, uh, placed quite well to take advantage of it because it is coming. That's it. I'll stop. That's great. Um, and, and a quick follow up because Teresa and, and Duke, you kind of spoke about like, you know, the importance of relationships and, and Duke and our, our prep, you had you know, stressed that that's one critical difference between, you know, selling in the private sector versus the public sector is just the, the focus on like a relationship driven marketing effort. Would you like to spend, you know, uh, you know, a little bit of time just uh, expounding on that. I'll let Teresa go first. She's uh, in the seat. Teresa, we'll start with you. Um, forgive me. I'm sorry. My my audio was a little bit. Uh, can you say your question again? Sure. So, so the question is, um, I, I think in, in our prep we talked about uh, the importance of a relationship driven approach to how how that's much more important in the, you know, it, within the federal space versus, you know, the private sector. Can So can you just, um, you know, maybe give some like examples or insights on the importance of a relationship driven, you know, sales and marketing approach from, um, sure. you know, from your perspective. So um, I know that, and I'm going to probably some folks who are in BD might be sad about what I say. But I know that there are times where, where you all are, uh, listen, I found out so many things from the industry because I opened up, um, I opened up and decided to say, okay, we got to start having more conversations so that I can understand you, you can understand me, we can get to our end goal. So a lot of times I've heard, um, matter of fact, I was just in a training the other day and I heard the BD person stand up and say, well, you know, if you don't have a relationship or you don't have a conversation with anybody in the office, you're not going to win. Um, and I've been on the contracting officer side. I've been on the requirements owner side. I've been a program manager. I've been an evaluator. I've been a decision authority. So I've run through it all. Um, I, I want to tell you that I, I would, we would like to see more companies bid, regardless if you talk to somebody or not, because I'm going to give you some insider baseball. We don't always like the incumbent either. <laughs> we don't always like the folks that call us all the time. We don't like the folks that are silent all the time. It's no, what I'm saying is we don't have a set of ground rules internally that will make us be attracted to a particular company other than can you meet my mission? And when you talk to us that you understand our mission, I'm going to keep saying the same thing over and over again, that the connection that we're going to have with you is really dependent on you understanding me more than if you know a particular person in the office. Actually, most of us contracting officers, if we recognize that a relationship is too you're too comfortable, we'll kick that person off the evaluation or tell them they can't be an, uh, a requirement writer. Um, there are certain things that will happen because of that. So there's a fine line with having a relationship and exploiting that relationship, which is good because, you know, the more you know someone, you know their mission. Um, 
but again, I've watched it be uh, something that actually hurt in the end. But relationships are good. And then on the government side, I'll say this from a personal perspective, we are working on being more open with industry so we could stop having you know, companies continue to try to spend so much money and time getting at that one person, getting that one connection. Um, I know the FAR was recently updated, even though it's one line, it's a step <laughs> towards something good, is that we need to be more transparent with industry. We need to have more industry engagement. And particularly within the Air Force and even the DOD, I've been doing my rounds telling folks, have a conversation with industry. Your silence makes a difference. It actually speaks volumes. Um, and then it looks, it sends a message that is usually not true. I can't say 100% because I'm not in everyone's office. So that's what I'll say about the relationship building. I think it's great, but from 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 my perspective, and especially in sitting in all those seats and wearing all those hats, it could actually be something that hurts as well as helps. So just be, you got to find that balance. And I feel for industry. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes a lot of times. I thank you for all that you do to help us meet our mission. Over. That's amazing, Teresa. That's really helpful. Uh, you know, definitely a different take as well. Like I wouldn't have thought of having an amazing relationship can almost get counterproductive. So you have to, I guess, you know, stay in the uh, you know stay in the middle of of knowing someone you know well enough, but almost not too too close to them. Uh, Duke, what are you? What are your thoughts? Well, it it plays off uh, something that uh, Teresa was just saying. Your interaction and that relationship is not about you getting comfortable uh, like an old shoe with a government client. It's about you constantly understanding what is your value proposition to that agency, that organization, that entity, um, because that's going to evolve over time. That's going to change because the things and challenges, the priorities that they have in that entity are going to adjust over time based on changes of administration, changes of the international environment, the domestic environment, whatever it is. And you can change with them in the package of goods and services that you're offering, but only if you're understanding what is going on inside that agency and that entity. And that's where the relationship comes in. That's that business intelligence piece where you understand, holy cow, we could add a lot more value if we adjust the package. And maybe they can do a contract change. They don't have to wait till a new solicitation. They may be able to do a change order depending on the parameters under which that particular contract was awarded. Um, and so, and that kind of dialogue and interaction is very productive and the government wants it. The other thing that's happening right now in the executive departments, uh, especially in, I know in DOD is that uh, some of the departments used to be ahead of the private sector in technology. You know, when I was a young officer, they were. Communications quickly, they fell behind in the nineties. And now in almost every sector of scientific and technological development, the government is not ahead of industry. Industry is ahead of government. And all these entities, the lab systems, the pro procurement systems were all designed when the expertise was in-house and in-house was ahead of the civilian market. And they're only now changing and adapting to be fast followers in terms of procurement of tech and application and integration of existing commercial off-the-shelf technology. And they're not good at it. You know, and there's constant criticism in the agencies themselves and in the Congress and other places and in industry that they aren't good at it. And so there are prol a proliferation of innovation centers and portals, some of which will prove to be useful and real and some of which will, will not be for real. They will die out over time because they don't succeed. And we don't know which ones those are in this archipelago of innovation centers, right? And so you have to be very judicious in your funnel, what's going in the funnel and which entity you're proposing to and why, and understand you know, how much, how many can we propose to and not win how many can we afford? Because, you know, proposals take takes money, just like engagement and BD and capture take money. So um, that transition is happening uh, and DOD is continuing to experiment and Congress is continuing to give it authorities and certain funding lines to experiment. We just started an office of strategic capital in the Department of Defense to make low interest loans to businesses that are, have promising tech. This is sort of some of the things we did at a rapid pace in the period of emergency, 1940 to 42, we're doing sort of in slow motion rolling out now to make the procurements within DOD, and I know it's happening in other agencies in, in other formats, more rapid and not quite so sclerotic and expensive. Uh, yeah, that's amazing insight. The, I love the fast fo follower uh, you know, line. Hopefully, hopefully we all get there as a nation. Um, 
great segue into um, kind of moving beyond those initial relationships and thinking about best practices around um, organizing your function around, you know, the BD capture proposal, you know, business intelligence process, preparing your organization for success. You know, great question to start with, with Nora. What are your, your thought, thoughts on that? Sure. And I'll probably approach this from just a very practical manner. Um, I view BD, uh, their role is building pipelines, segueing to capture, you know, once an opportunity, you pass gate review. So capture is really focused on a particular solicitation or that person may be focused on multiple particular solicitations. And then proposal, I think about it as the final articulation of your strategy and approach because proposal is really a technical sales document. So while BD and capture are providing continuously updated intelligence, that intelligence has to get articulated in that proposal response strategy as well as integrated throughout the proposal itself. Um, and as we all know, federal solicitations are complex, deadlines are tight, and it's easy to get caught up in the hustle of proposal development. Um, but I want the audience to always think about the challenge is not collecting that market intelligence, but it's a synthesis of the insights gained, what does it mean? And if you're doing the work as an industry architect, got to bring those insights into proposal, tie it back to the agency mission. Um, so let's just, you know, basic advice would be like, understand the purpose of those roles, their differences, how they relate. Times have really changed. Pressure is increasing. Competition is increasing. Um, so also be sure you're adopting a tech stack that serves the entire end-to-end -end process, all of the roles, all of those workflows. Um, we tell people, you know, adopt a continuous quality improvement approach align incentives and, um, you know, definitely don't be late to that kind of evolving technology landscape party. Excellent. Thank you, Nora. Uh, Duke, you you started getting into this on, on, on your last answer. Uh, what are your thoughts? So whatever size firm you are, you must have a, a one or more proposal teams and that's what they do. And that's all they do because it's a set of ex skills and expertise into the federal markets that you, you put together a project delivery team and your proposal that you say, these people work together on this project. But meanwhile, they're all working on other projects. They may come together if you win the award, but they're not together now. And to say that we're gonna have this prospective project delivery team is gonna write the proposal, that's a recipe for failure. You're just not gonna succeed or you'll succeed at such a low rate that it may not be worth competing in the markets. I don't know about the other markets, architecture, engineering, construction in the federal markets. If your proposal team is winning 30% of the bids, that's an all-star hall of fame proposal team. So that gives you a perspective that you're probably going to be one in one for five, you know, uh, any given per period of time with a really good proposal team. Sometimes the government doesn't tell you how they're going to evaluate. They just give you lowest price, technically acceptable or best value. And generally they'll have some categories, but sometimes they specify in quite a bit of outline detail, here's the technical and the managerial evaluation. One ABC, two ABC, three ABC. Always submit your proposal following that outline. Yes, you can add your comparative advantage. You can add your unique valuable thing that you do in there, but if you have to follow that outline because the selection board, and if it's a big enough procurement, it's a selection board, not an individual, they're busy people and they're going to get four or five or eight of these proposals from companies on large, complicated proposals, and they're going to go through them. And, you know, they're intelligent people who are well thinking and experienced, but they are also have a checklist. Did they address this in the proposal? Did they address that in the proposal? And if they can't find it or you make it hard to find because you didn't follow their outline, you may not get credit for it. Now, you can talk about that later, maybe in your back brief, but you want to win it up front and outright, right? Right away. So uh, follow that outline, insert within it those unique advantages that you see that you have compared to other potential competitors or extra value that you can offer the agency in the problem that they're trying to solve. Good answer. Thank you, Duke. Um, and in our prep, we you were talking about you know some of the, the, the scale, some of the projects you've worked on, you know, multiple billions of dollars taking place over, you know, many years. And then maybe think of, you know, continuity 
on on both sides within within the office uh, you're attempting to work with and, and with your own company. So at Leadership Connect, we did a, a benchmark. We do it each year of looking at the turnover of leadership within within offices, especially that procure technology, and then the contractors themselves. And I think the number that we came out with on the contractor side is about every 19 months, someone's turning over and within agencies, within the offices that focus on on technology or you know, emerging technology, it's about you know, 21 to 24 months. So if you think of you're dealing with someone, you kind of have a 50% chance they're not gonna be there. Uh, the following year. So so when you think of a process that accounts for that continuity, uh, maybe Duke and Nora, I'll, I'll ask you from like the, the contractor's you know, perspective, how do you do that? Like what are best practices so you don't have all this intelligence walk out, walk out the door with this turnover? And then, you know, Teresa, I'll ask you the same questions, but from the, you know, uh, DOD's perspective, start with Duke. Starting with me or with Nora? Uh, with Duke, sorry. Yeah, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, so I think a couple of things. Obviously, succession planning, but at every level, the project on-site level, the, the project manager level, the program manager level within the company. And then, frankly, for some projects, if they're mega projects and they're really that big, it's going to be the C-suite level, right? Uh, and, of course, you boards should have succession plans for those all the time anyway. And then for these major projects, projects, your project governance is going to be different than a standard package project that you do for 10 to $50 million for somebody. These things are going to be, yes, there's going to be daily meetings. There's going to be weekly meetings with the crew that's delivering. There's going to be monthly meetings at the managerial level. And then every quarter, the president of the construction companies involved in this mega project, let's say it's construction because that's I'm most familiar with. Uh, if it's a $2 billion plus contract, the presidents of those construction companies will be at that governance meeting every quarter. The designer of record will be present in person at that meeting because that governance board is only getting the, the boogered problems that no one else can solve at the lower level. And it's going to be very challenging and you're going to have to do some negotiation in there at a decision-making level. So that's going to be general officers, admirals, flag officers in the room. If it's DOD and the services, it's going to be you know, CEOs of other commercial companies if it's a commercial project for you. And so that, again... That's costly. It takes time. It takes leader time that you're not used to expending necessarily on smaller projects or portfolio of smaller projects that are easier to manage. Uh, because again, mega projects can go off track quickly and can be unrecoverable. And if it's a government contract, in many cases, uh, you face some very uh, disgusting choices if you're not careful, because Congress may or may not appropriate more money to complete the project that's overrun. They may not, you may start to cut scope. And now you're looking at something much less than what was uh, contracted and awarded. And that's gonna be reflected in your performance evaluation as well as you know, the agency's reputation. So uh, there, the governance associated with the mega project is much more intense, much more high level participation and routine than in these smaller projects. And I would just offer the more you can modularize, whether that's a long supply type contract uh, or if it's an architecture, engineering, construction project, the more you can modularize it so that over the course of the life of the project, learning can happen and efficiencies can be gained, then you will be successful in bringing it on time and under budget or on budget. The more bespoke it is, the more unique and tailored it is in every respect uh, for the full scope of the project. You're looking at a Sydney Opera House or some other catastrophe, you know, in terms of cost and schedule uh, that you really don't want to have. I mean, it's a great landmark and a, and, a, and a beautiful thing, but it could have been done for less than a quarter of the price and in half the time. Uh, that's excellent, Duke. And I visited the Sydney Opera House. It is beautiful. So whatever it costs. Uh, as a tourist is worth seeing. Nora, uh, continuity. So uh, and I think it's a fine answer from, um, you know, a, small business, you know, mid-sized business perspective as well. Yeah, that's some, like, those are two mind-blowing stats. Like I had, until you shared that, I wouldn't have guessed that. That's that's just, it really does blow my mind. And I, I think sometimes we're so head down in programmatic delivery. We often, um, um, we're just so busy. We need to connect back to kind of BD efforts 
because there's a lot of learnings we're gaining. So how do we mine that intelligence, that internal intelligence, and then share that in terms of our work as an industry architect and um, uh, and what Teresa said earlier about the long-term relationships don't get too comfortable. So always be forward-looking um, and, and understand where that mission is going. I think one way that you can always provide value, no matter what you're doing, is offer options and then what's going to happen as a result of taking those options and helping people anticipate. So establish relationships through multiple layers of the agency, align with their strategic goals, their mission. Um, that way, when there's changes, your contribution is recognized. You've got those working relationships and the working relationship is, fo is focused on being forward-looking in terms of um, helping shape the future of the agency and the industry. Great, Nora, thank you. Teresa, you, you have a unique perspective because you, you get the um, challenges of continuity from both sides, both from the contractor and then internally with, you know, a program office, the contracting team, your leadership, like what are your suggestions for managing through that and best practices? I think we lost Teresa. Uh, I don't see her on the screen, yeah. Maybe Tati reach out to Teresa and we'll try to get her back on. Uh, I know she's in a secure facility, so that is a bit of a challenge. Um, all right, so let's, let's move to the next question on partnering. Um, you know, in our prep, we talked a lot about, you know, partners. Obviously, we started a little bit with, with subcontractors. You alluded to like OTAs. We talked about um, you know Sibbers. I know certain contractors you know look at Sibber award recipients as potential acquisition targets. Certainly partnering on um, on future awards. So there's a lot of different flavors around you know partnering. So Nora, maybe we'll we'll start with you. Um, can you share some of your kind of hidden insights on, on partnering and what you've seen is successful? Well, you know, I think a trend we've all seen the last several years is contracting is becoming more complex. So it's becoming more unlikely that a single entity can fulfill the solutioning needs um, of a particular kind of program and the solicitations within that program. So uh, early partnerships are best. Um, you've got to pick the best teams kind of with the best companies that complement your capabilities, filling your gaps. And you also want to partner with folks and it's gonna be you know, the obvious statement. Uh, the ones that are performing well, because you're gonna pair your insights, you're gonna pair and team your um, approaches and your solutioning, because you wanna go beyond just meeting the requirements. Um, years ago, uh, healthcare started moving from something called volume to value. And I kind of want to introduce that concept into the federal contracting community and urge us to do the same because like we may increase P win by throwing our hats into the bucket more often, but it's really not a sustainable long-term strategy. Um, the only way to scale that is by doing more kind of, if you're going to spray and pray, you got to spray and pray more, right? Because the only way to scale is you've got to operationalize key components of BD capture proposal program and operations. And while you can scale any, everything and anything, it may not lead you to where you want to go. Um, I always think of this saying my parents would ask me if I would ask them something and they would look at me and say, just because like everyone else is running off a cliff, are you going to do the same thing? And so um, think about not just increasing the volume of your submissions. That may not be the way to go because it also, as Duke has alluded to, um, increases your opportunity costs. Those costs have to get absorbed somewhere. So, you know, focus your efforts partner with the right people and definitely um, try not to go it alone all the time. Yeah, I think that's in part referred to as activity Armageddon, where you generate as much activity as you can because you think, you know, to get a better result, you just need to generate more of the same activity. So I, I think for, uh, as a world, especially with AI on um, helping you like generate emails and, and everything, uh, you know, we're seeing, you know, the limits of just using yeah. volume. We also have to be very thoughtful about this. Uh, Duke, 
what are your thoughts on partnering um, kind of both large and small? Well, uh, you know, for, for large firms, it can be useful to partner with small businesses of various types. So there are a variety of types, right? The SBA lists them. And because federal contracts, not 100% of all work has to be self-performed, certain percentages have to be depending on the type of work. You can, you can generate some work for your firm as a partner to a small business venture that has won a variety of types of contracts, right? So that's one way. And if say you're a constructor and they're a design firm, you can generate a fruitful symbiotic partnership uh, that involves them working on things that aren't small business set-asides, but it, it opens small business set-asides up for you to receive some revenue from also, so that's one st uh, st strategic method to think about it as a, as a vendor. The other thing is some things are just too gigantic as, as Nora was saying, for one company to be able to deliver, both usually because of expertise, not necessarily capacity, but uh, sometimes both. In, in the AEC world, uh, you know, you're talking about, uh, we have all sorts of CHIPS Act uh, incentives in, uh, that are fostering these uh, campuses for both EVs and for, uh, chip making in the US. Well, those campuses start at 10 billion and go to as high as 40 billion when their full scope is gonna be realized. Well, there's no company in the world that can be bonded for $10 billion, it doesn't exist. So that's a partnership, that's a joint, that's a JV partnership that's gonna be doing that project and it's gonna have multiple partners. So I think internally training and preparing people for the negotiations at a company and the due diligence that accompanies forming a joint venture partnership it's not quite as dramatic and as intensive as a you know, leverage buyout due diligence, but it's close. I mean, it's, uh, and ideally you wanna create it with people with whom you have some uh, complementary core skill sets. You don't necessarily wanna train your competitor in your JV, right? Who's gonna outbid you or, or, or get a better bid than you on the next big project. Uh, that's always a concern for vendors in every field, not just the AEC. So how, someone brings heavy civil to it and you are very much better with the design and, and vertical. That's a great partnership, right? That everybody can win from. And it, you know, it doesn't result in any cannibalism inside the JV over the life of the project, right? Which, you know, the negotiation starts and you have a JV agreement at the beginning, but that does continue to evolve during the project too, as change orders and everything else are received, whether that's IT or construction or anything else. So uh, it is... Uh, like Winston Churchill said, fighting a war with allies is the most difficult thing in the world, except for fighting one without them. Uh, and that's sometimes what a JV partnership is like. <laughs> that's a great line. Um, certainly, you know, we see best practice from our clients of like first really, and it kind of gets back to the business intelligence uh, part of it of like seeing who's active in the market um, you know, who's doing well in, in, in CPARs, creating a, you know, a short list of potential partners or FSIs to, you know, to deal with, um, you know, whether, whether you're on kind of the larger side and you want to look at, you know, someone going through an OTA program or sieve or sitter, you know, program or vice versa, you want to kind of uh, start to amp up your, your federal business. So certainly I would encourage everyone on this call to kind of know who the players are in, in their space around their, their capabilities are definitely not findable. We certainly uh, help with that as, as an organization. Um, also, we've seen some of our clients partner with people that they would consider like directly competitive or semi-competitive, but they're willing to give up a piece of the deal in order to ride on top of an existing award or you know, a relationship they already have. So I think people tend to get, you know, pretty, um, you know, pretty creative with the deal you know, with this stuff. Um, all right, so let's, um, let's move to the next question around, you know, compliance and just your, you know, your thoughts on getting into the federal state uh, space, staying compliant. You know, we have a, a question related to, you know, FedRAMP, uh, you know, I know certainly from, you know, my perspective, that's a, uh, not the most enjoyable journey going, <laughs> going through that, but, uh, you know, Duke, you touched a little bit on, on, on the SaaS space. So, you know, when you think of compliance, like where, you know, where do you, where do you, where do you start? What do you know what's important? You know, how do you have an internal process to stay 
compliant. Nora, we'll, we'll start with you. And there are so many layers to compliance. Like the first thing that comes to my mind is like, just don't do it alone. It's too big. It's too much information. Some of that information conflicts. You've got to get professional um, professional expertise, especially, uh, I mean, if you even think about just um, like the flow downs from contracts, a lot of times they, they conflict with one another. Um, and it's more than just keeping up with like laws or regulations or policies. You have to know how to apply them, best practices, like understand the implications and how to operationalize them. Um, or else you guys all know what's going to happen in audit. Like that will not be a good day in your life. Um, there's industry associations. And then um, definitely be proactive in terms of implementing, like you talked about, a systematic approach, training, internal review, internal education. And then there's technology stacks that we can take advantage of these days that we didn't used to have because you're going to navigate and this is only going to get more complex. Great insight. Thanks, Nora. Uh, Duke. Yeah, so uh, you, you have to pay attention to uh, laws that are being passed that uh, are associated with appropriations. And sometimes some federal budgets are authorized as well as appropriated. And there's lots of policy guidance that goes into that, that creates standards for the agencies. In many cases, the agencies may be responding to this congressional requirement for a new compliance standard, and they aren't quite sure how they're going to implement it yet. And so you can have a dialogue with a relationship. You can have a dialogue with them about the best, most efficient way to achieve the purposes of the legislation and uh, the intention of the legislation and accomplish that at most cost effectively. Uh, so that's one of the benefits of that relationships that we were talking about earlier. Uh, the other thing is you pay close attention to the federal register because any new policy is going to be announced there first and there's going to be a comment period that can be, that's a formal part, right? And so those comments do need to be addressed before the rulemaking is allowed to proceed. Um, and so uh, you have some input up front uh, with compliance standards uh, before they go into effect. And then once they're in effect, if you have complied, you then have some input to how they might be improved. Um, but there's a key thing is in the federal government, some of these standards and requirements are not permanent. You know, you get a DUNS number, you have a DUNS number, unless you change your location or the core business, you're, you got it forever, right? That ain't it for compliance with the federal government. Many things are annual requirements and they have to be continually attested to and, and, and inspected and audited and then certified that they were audited and re-registered, et cetera. So that is, again, additional administrative expense that's associated with federal work, uh, but it, it just is a requirement. There, there's no fire and forget compliance there. We've complied, you know, check, we're done. It doesn't exist in the in the federal markets. That's great, Duke. And I know in prep with with Teresa, you know, she had a great insight in terms of having compliance work for you. So let's say you're small business emerging tech, and uh, the you know program office that you're working with has would like to work with you, but there's some conservatism around trying out a, a new vendor. Is actually working with them to get. Um, in you know in the program a requirement for a small business so to you know de-risk from the contracting officer's perspective working with small business so compliance is not always a make work project sometimes it can be you know leveraged as you know really a selling tool or or a business development tool so we have about you know one minute left I want to thank thank my panelists um, let's let's do thirty seconds each uh, Teresa brought this up. Uh, you know, sometimes the, the lack of quality from the contracting community around asking questions, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. There's a perceived conservativeness around asking questions. So Nora, I'll start with you, like 30 seconds on best practices around ask, uh, asking I mean, questions. I'll, I'll narrow it down to 10 seconds. Like before that RFP hits, ask early, ask often, no question is dumb. Um, ask appropriate questions, but uh, just just ask, have those dialogues because you know you, you've got a shared goal there and that's what you're trying to work for and a shared understanding. Don't come from it from a sales perspective. Come from it from a shared uh, shared understanding perspective. Awesome. Thanks, Nora. Duke. 
Yeah. So again, because some of these rulemakings are in progress and are being done on the fly as a result of re requirements placed on the agencies themselves in any federal department, asking those questions up front uh, is very helpful for them to even come to a position that they may not have already had, right, in the agency itself. So, you know, we have new tech, we want to sell it to DOD. Well, uh, does this fall under ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, or does it fall under the ex uh, Export uh, uh, Control Act regulations, which, because uh, it's just a commercial use case right now, but, you know, if it's going to be used in the military, maybe, you know, what do we do? Which rules do we follow, you know, or submit to? And that can save you some time because you're going to submit once instead of twice. Uh, so that those kinds of questions that are informed, because you understand that there's a requirement, you're just not sure which one applies. And right now there's a lot of attention across the federal departments in supply chain security and therefore who owns your suppliers. If you, and I think most of our, your, 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 vent, your clients will, will have them. And sometimes ownership discovery is tricky. Uh, and you may have to employ consultants to help you uh, if you don't have a clear cut supply chain yourself. And obviously we encourage you to have one, you know, you know who owns the firms that are selling to you and where they're getting their materials, because that is of interest, particularly to DOD, but not just, but to the other federal departments as well. And I see that only becoming more stringent over time and not less given the situation in the world and economic competition in the globe. Great point. All right. Uh, one minute over, we'll, we'll, we'll cut it off there. We're going to uh, put together follow-up notes for registrants of the webinar. We'll have those available over the next couple of days, along with uh, a link to uh, share the broadcast with everyone. Really want to thank Nora and Duke uh, and Teresa for a phenomenal discussion and hope everyone has a great rest of Thursday. Thank you. Thank you.